look forward to a Kadashi, a best prashad of the, the, the month of a Kadashi. First class Kadashi feast. I know I promised that we were told, I was that well, it's hard for them to, for, to follow this vrata of a Kadashi. No grains. So at least they should have a feast to compensate for some kind. That was our philosophy anyway. Okay, so today we're reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, chapter 2, chapter 1. Um, I guess we'll just say a couple of words about Madhavacharya before we start. I'm not really prepared, but we'll sort of try to say a few words. Um, yeah, I didn't bring the songbook. Do we have a songbook here? Oh, no, it's okay, don't worry. It's only one or two lines. If there is one, you can bring it. I hope it's, hope it's findable. I hope it's in here because not all of them have got this song in. The standard one, this is some local print, I wouldn't have a clue where to find it. Well, the normal one, the BBT prints, this is not the BBT print. It might be in here. Yeah, it's in here. Thank you. 
Madhava Tirtha accepted the great Paramahamsa Akshobhya Tirtha as a disciple. The principal disciple of Akshobhya Tirtha was known as Jaya Tirtha, serving whom was Jana Sindhu's only purpose of, excuse me, of life. Mm. So, basically this song, oh, excuse me, this song is a song of the glorious Acharyas in their disciplic succession and how one to the next they passed the imparted section to the next like Narayana imparted to Vyasadev section gave him passed on the knowledge disciplic succession means the passing on of the knowledge it's not just the formality it's the really the essential part is the Transference of the knowledge down in the line of disciplined succession to present day and present day Sangha association of the Buddhists. So Madhava, Madhava Charya, Madhava uh, Puna Prajitirtha, as he was known as when he was younger, Puna Prajitirtha, was. Um, one of the significant great acharyas in their disciplic succession, their line of succession is um, amongst acharyas, he's considered to be the kind of acharya of their line, really, the Madhava Sampradaya. He stands back to Brahma, the four Sampradayas. We're in the one coming from Lord Brahma. Brahma, Madhva, Gaudiya. Godia because Lord Chaitanya in line he took initiation in that line from Ishwar Puri Madhava Puri, Madhavendra Puri and so on they were in the line from Madhava Charya so Lord Chaitanya accepted that line although you know their you could say their form of worship is somewhat reverential or Aishwarya Bhav Lord Chaitanya was preaching Madhurya Bhav, he gave much deeper bhakti with some other aspects of Chinchu Veda Veda the oneness is not so much understood in the Madhva Sampradaya in its transcendental sense, they consider that impersonal Brahman. As Lord Chaitanya's as a explanation, his delivery of this oneness with the Lord is oneness in loving exchange. It's not just reverential service. I mean, fine points. But basically, the Madhava Sampradaya, which believes that Krishna is God, that we're all God and the living entities are eternally distinct. Living entities' ultimate role is service to God. We can learn how to serve God through the Vedas. And, no different premises are there, which are all not different than the premises of Gaudiya Vaishnava, it's just that Gaudiya Vaishnava has more, um, same spectrum in understanding of the absolute truth. But what they do believe is correct, the path of attaining, of course, many times now they emphasize perhaps rituals and social structures as um, primary and worship mainly in Vaikuntha mood. Uh, not wrong, but it's not as complete. So Madhvacharya had his role to play to specifically defeat Mayavad philosophy, which was rampant at the time when he appeared in the world. Not clear when he appeared, some Biographies describe he appeared in the about, around about 11, 11 or something like that. Others describe he appeared in 12, 12, 24, and things like that, 12, 27 or something. But it is generally understood that he lived for around 80 years at least. He spent at least 80 years on the planet. He was born in a village near Udupi. Karnataka in South India. And uh, right from childhood, he was 
extraordinary child and power, not just spiritual power, but physical power also, mystical powers also. He's not an ordinary, ordinary jiva by any means. Um, and he appeared for a mission, this mission, most important mission, to defeat Mayavada and establish Vaishnavism, even if it's not complete in all of its aspects. He established Vaishnavism as the constitution, constitutional reality of, or of a living entity. And his physical strength, many times he displayed physical strength or mystic powers when he was very young. His father apparently had some large debts which were causing great disturbance. Madhvacharya took a tamarind seed and transformed it into many jewels to pay the debts. He uh, easily won as a little child. He fought with a deadly snake who was actually a demon and killed it. Whenever his mother, even if he was a long distance away, if ever his mother thought of him or thought of needed him, he would immediately appear on the scene. He could jump miles and miles. He could just jump. But that's not surprising because when he left the world, um, the demigods, just like yesterday when Bhishma left the world, and all the heavenly planets, they all got news quicker than, quicker than, um, quicker than text messages, quicker than Facebook, quicker than internet. They all heard quickly that he's passing away. And all the demigods assembled to hear and then they showered flowers on him. Similarly with Madhavacharya, the demigods showered flowers on him when he left his body. His body was spiritual, but still that pastime of leaving takes place. And not only that, but they started glorifying him. Oh great, oh great Acharya, oh great devotee. Oh, who is none other than Vayu, the demigod of the wind. Oh, great devotee, you are no different than Bhima Sain. Oh, great devotee, no different than Hanuman. He was, all these three, four personalities we see here are from the same basic uplands of the Lord, although manifest in different forms. The basic same uplands of the Lord is manifest as power, strength, great strength, ability to fly, great strength, etc. So he had tremendous strength. There was one um, proud fellow who was said to be like the strongest, can't remember his name. So Madhavacharya tested his strength and he just put his big toe on the floor and said, pick up my big toe. He couldn't budge it an inch. Couldn't budge it an inch. He was very strong, very strong. He would fight with tigers. Yes, he fought with tigers also. No problem. <laughs> he fought also many, I mean, he was very brave. Extremely brave. And he sometimes he was attacked with dacoits when he was on his way to Badrikar Badr Ashram to meet Vyasadeva. He fought with bands of dacoits and kill them all. He didn't beat around the bush. He was very athletic personality also, said he. He participated purposely in wrestling and swimming and various other sports. Very strong, very strong. When he was young, not so young, he was living in Udupi. He'd already become greatly well-renowned devotee, causing great concern to the Shringeri Mat especially, which is not so far away. They tried to challenge him in various ways, but nothing, he was never defeated. They would defeat them in debates. It was his mission to uh, set the way for Lord Chaitanya's appearance but bring, bring him back into, you know, let's say, into the public awareness, Vaishnavism, and 
introducing Vaishnavism. And uh, like that, when he was, one day he was on the beach um, and he saw in the distance there was one boat, a big boat, which was coming from Dwarka. Some or another it was in difficulty, rocks or sand dunes or something, some problem was there. And they were, they didn't know, you know they were lost, they were lost, they were in very great difficulty. So Madhavacharya, knowing what well, he knows so many things, but he was able to guide the boat to safety. Uh, by various signs and so on, he guided the boat to safety. So the captain of the ship, he was, he wanted to um, to give something as a gift to Madhavacharya, so he something useful. So he had a very large, enormous chunk of Gobichan, Tilak, on the boat. So he wanted to gift this to Madhvacharya. So as he was giving this, there were different stories actually, Mr. As he was giving the, the chunk of Tilak, the chunk cracked in half. Cracked in half, huge chunk. And as I say, there are different stories, and you'll read different stories. But in this case, when the chunk cracked in half, suddenly there was a deity of Balaram in the middle of the chunk. Beautiful. Madhavacharya then arranged for the installation of that deity of Balaram there on a temple on the beach side. So then he carried, it was very heavy, very heavy, like 30 men could carry, but Madhavacharya carried the chunk back to a dupi. And there he immersed the chunk in the temple tank. And sure enough, out of that chunk, the deity of Krishna appeared, covered by the tilak. And this is Udupi Krishna. You know. Udupi Krishna, if you've been to Udupi, you may have seen. So that deity then was installed there in Udupi and worshipped by Madhvacharya, and then of course by his disciples, and he established several mats, and his disciples were the, you know, the mats in each of the mats around India. He traveled around India preaching. And he took Siksha from uh, Madhavacharya, up from Vyasadeva in the Bhattacharya He took Siksha there. And he compiled various scriptures on Vaishnava and commentaries on various Upanishads and so on. But when he left his body, he just finished commentary on Taitavira Upanishad. And then he left the world. But he left a legacy, as we have just heard, of many eligible, qualified disciples. And not different, as we mentioned, and Vayu and Bhima and Madhavacharya ki jai go premanandi Om namo bhagavate vasudevai 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 Today we're reading Srimad Bhagavatam, the first step in God realization, chapter number one, text number six, canto two. It's a very um another very wonderful verse, especially famous for its conclusion. Etavan. Gabhyam Svadharma Parinishtaya Janma Lava Para Pusam Ante Narayan Smitihi. That's a very famous line. 
Narayana and De Narayana Smriti, one of the most famous lines in Bhagavatam. Etavan Sankhya Yoga Vyam. Svadharma Parinishtaya. Janmalava Parakpum Sam. Narayana Smitihi Etavan Sankhya Yoga Vyam Svadharma Paranishtaya Janmalava Parakpum Sam Ante Narayana Smitihi Saying that this is 
spiritual experience. I see like you know, bells ringing and water, ocean. Baba would say this is proof that there is variety of form in the spiritual world. See, you're hearing bells. Everything that is created, sustained, and at the end annihilated is within the compass of the Mahatattva, material principle, and its unformed potential energy. The energy is there, but it's not in form, shape, Mahatattva. It's all contained there. Lord Brahma and others have the role of taking the energies and making, putting it, just like we do. Sometimes you take earth and bits and pieces and make a house put form to the, you know, the, the energy is already seen it's on the gross platform the Mahatta is on the subtle platform and beyond and above that is the Pradhana which is um, being efficient the way is beyond the actual uh, in, in breakdown you could say of the subtle energy potential energy in various forms in the Mahatta the Pradhana is like one energy the existence in Narayan, or the personality of Godhead, is not within the jurisdiction of this Mahatattva. Oh look, Lord Viraz appeared on the page there. His name, Lord Viraz appeared and stays soon. And such, and as such, the name, form, attributes, etc. of Narayan are beyond the jurisdiction of the material world. Hard for people within the material world to grasp this understanding that when the Lord appears in this world that he's beyond it and his name when it's being chanted is also beyond this material world. Everything is, he has form, hard for people to imagine. Interesting, this is related to Madhavacharya in some ways. God has a form um, because most people only have an understanding of material form so as soon as you mention form they, they have a hard time conceiving of spiritual form because they have no realization no understanding of what to do so again they don't discuss too much of these details of God in public at least by the speculation of empiric philosophy, which discerns matter from spirit, or by cultivation of mystic powers, which ultimately helps the performer to reach any planet of the universe or beyond the universe, or by discharge of religious duties, one can achieve the highest perfection provided one is able to reach the stage of Narayana Smriti, or constant remembrance of the personality of God. Basically, that's the instruction of the Bhagavad Gita. It's the Parabhasya Sutra of the Gita. It's the Manmanabhava, Manbhakto, Madhyaji, Mahamas, Guru. The key verse, the essential verse of Gita, you could say, which is the whole objective of the of the book, or the teaching, is Manmanabhava, Manbhakto, Madhyaji, Mahamas, Guru, to always think of Krishna. Offer a homage and obeisance unto him, worship Krishna. This way you will come to me, being always absorbed in me. Uh, this is the, said to be by Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur, the key verse, or the uh, supreme objective verse of, of the Bhagavad Gita. So the result of devotional service is to come to this platform. A result of surrender is the one. They say the process of surrender involves hearing, chanting, remembering. But when one comes to that fullness, Always remember Krishna. Smarta Vyasa Tam Vishnu Vishmata Vyana All the rules and regulations that we follow are meant for this principle to always remember Krishna and never forget him. This is the principle. Always remember Krishna, never forget him. If we're always remembering him, we're not forgetting him. If we never forget him, we're remembering him. Opposites are given now. And that's what this verse today is aiming at. To always remember we can expect we can't expect an honorary degree. Like sometimes a person receives an honorary degree. 
be liberated. Well, it's not so easy to remember Krishna at the time of death. It's not within our control to decide what we remember. Out of control, practically. Only if we've taken shelter of Krishna and Krishna himself takes control can we really have that good fortune to remember him at the time of death. And do us pray that and please may I not forget you at the time of death, please. Yeah, and different prayers are there. Because without his mercy we cannot remember him. Even if we practice in this lifetime. The recommendation of course is to practice in this lifetime. So we're preparing ourselves for death at every moment. Not we have to wait for the moment which may come unexpectedly also. We should be preparing ourselves at every moment. Death or having to leave this body behind. And Prabhupada goes on. This is possible only by the association of the pure devotee who can give a finishing touch to the transcendental activities of all jnanis, yogis or karmis in terms of prescribed duties defined in the scriptures. There are many historical incidences of the achievement of spiritual perfection such as that of Sanakadi Rishis or the nine celebrated Yogendras who attained perfection only after being situated in the devotional service of the Lord. None of the devotees of the Lord ever deviated from the path of devotional service by taking to other methods as adopted by the jnanis or yogis. The purpose of jnana, the purpose of yoga, the purpose of everything is to remember Krishna. It's not some purpose in of itself, it's a useless waste of time. We hear from the first canto, it's from Avi he cave alone. All the activities we perform do not evoke an attraction to the personality of Godhead. They're a waste of time. Whatever they are, they're a waste of time. Material activities or some kind of spiritual pursuit, unless it awakens our attraction towards the remembrance of Krishna, they're a waste of time. Examples are given here of persons who practice remembering Krishna. And there are other many, many examples. Of course, here I mentioned maybe in one of the next verses the example of King Kapanga is mentioned how at the time of death he remembered Krishna, but that was by mercy. He begged for the boon that he could leave his body and remember Krishna. So he was devotee. We have a perhaps more expanded and relevant example in the case of a Jamio who somehow or another by good fortune and it's interesting probably mentions here by association this can be achieved this remembrance of Krishna and the association of the voice Tampa Sangamama various Sangamama in the association of the voice this attraction develops in the hearing of our Krishna so uh, Jamil, when he was a young boy, he was, his father was a devotee, pious person, and he followed his father's lifestyle. So he performed devotional service. Unknowingly, maybe you could say, or immaturely, he performed nonetheless. And as you know, the story goes that the young man he became overwhelmed by lust attracted to a prostitute and eventually married her and had many children. Even in old age he was having kids. I don't know how she was. He was having kids. So um, when death came, because he lived a really sinful life, practically the most sinful life, all regulated principles broken and many other sins he performed. So when time of death came, uh, the Yamadutas came because he was a very great sinner. Great sinner. But when he saw the Yamadutas, he was very attached to his youngest son named Narayan. He called out, Narayan, Narayan, help. 
อบพระไรเอนพระไรเอนพระไรเอน As the Yamadudas closed in on him, and when the Vishnu Dudas heard the name of their Lord mentioned, called, they immediately appeared. Stop! Don't step an inch further. You cannot touch this man. What are you doing? The Yamadudas were surprised. They'd never seen these guys, these guys before. Where are you from? Where are you coming from? Aliens. Come from Melbourne or where? <laughs> well, the the Yamadudas were shocked. You know what's going on here. Anyways, a long story. Six Canto Bhagavatam. Because he chanted Narayan, when he chanted Narayan, somehow or another, by the mercy of Krishna, because he did service never in vain, service doesn't go in vain. So, when he chanted Narayan, even though he was thinking of his son, he evoked a remembrance of Narayan. Child of his worship, his father worshiping Narayan. So anyway, they debated. Yamadutas Vishnu, Dutas Vishnu, Dutas one. And sent the Yamadutas back home, back to <laughs> the Yamaraj. So, uh, and of course they, they inquired from Yamaraj this, that, the other. Um, and because he chanted, just chanted the name Narayan, he was delivered to the time of death. But that wasn't the end of it. <coughs> he was then allowed to stay in his body. But he didn't go back to Godhead there and then. Practice devotional service, and don't fall down again. So he did. He left wherever he was, and uh, went somewhere near Kanpur. And he went to Hardwar, not too far away. And in Hardwar, he performed various austerities, devotional practices, and became fixed. In and then he went back to God when he was fixed. So they gave him that chance. They liberated him from going to hell. And then Yeshan Pandagatam Papam Janan Punyakarna. One has to be freed of all sinful reactions, acting piously in this life as well as the last, free of duality of this material. To engage, to engage properly in devotion of service with determination. So he was given that chance and he took it and he did engage in devotional service with determination and then when the time to leave his body came he remembered Krishna as the goal of life to remember Krishna. All the purposes of the Vedas are for that reason, to remember Krishna at the time of death. Underlying um, principle of Vedic literature, maybe not manifested, but it's the point behind it all. Prabhupada goes on. There are many historical instances in Britain. None of the devotees of the Lord ever deviated from the path of devotional service by taking to other methods, as adopted by the Gyanis or Yogis. Everyone is anxious to achieve the highest perfection of this particular activity, and is indicated herein that such perfection is Narayana Smriti, for which everyone must endeavor his best. In other words, life should be molded in such a manner that one is able to progressively remember the personality of God in every step of life. Molded. No, similarly, we're being molded to a certain extent with regulated principles, lifestyle, uh, even sleeping, everything is molded in such a way as to facilitate Narayana Smriti, anti-Narayana Smriti, and not just anti at the end, but now. Remember Krishna now, we don't know when the end comes anyway. Uh, yes, take for granted, it's not going to be now, but it will be now sometime. And it could happen in any moment. No one's fall infallible in this world. No one's fallible. You have to take shelter of the infallible, Personality of Godhead, true to Krishna, takes shelter of the infallible, 
Otherwise, we would take a shot of something else which is fallible. If it lasts a long time, it's still fallible. Or able to fall. Fallible means able to fall. Um, and that's the, the answer given here by Shukdev Goswami. What should we do at the time of death? Remember Krishna. Remember Krishna, that's the goal of yoga, goal of meditation, that's the goal of
answered very simply by Sukadeva Goswami. The goal at the end of our life is to remember Narayan. How do you remember it? That's the Bhagavatam. We're, we're, we're here now. Well, we've already heard in the first canto, but expanded in the remaining ten cantos how we can remember Krishna at the time of death. <coughs> how to fix our minds. And even chanting Japa. Sometimes there was a, a, how should we chant? One time she would probably answer, she should chant the Maha Mantra as if this is your last breath. Last breath. And we might be a bit more serious. Maybe a last breath, I better chant nicely. We can't take it for granted. When we're going to leave, we don't know, but we should be in that mood. Can't bang us up. He asked for the boon, how much longer I live. Demigod said, you will live another moment. Not the boon, he asked them to tell him um, how much longer he'll live, fighting for them. And they said, you'll live for one more moment. <laughs> and immediately he transferred, because the devotee transferred his consciousness to Krishna, lucky he knew. We don't know, even if we do know when we're going to leave her body, we don't know whether we're going to be able to remember Krishna. We should practice now, depend on Krishna. At the time of death, by the mercy of Krishna, we may be able to remember him. Jai Shubhapad Ki Jai, Vatrai Shumaparotam Ki Jai. Any questions?
strengthen our intelligence, how it says by reading. Our intelligence becomes stronger. I was interesting this morning, I mean, I'm, I may not ever get used to it, someone just gave me a Kindle, a new one, I got one, an old one, a new one, and it keeps popping up every time I press anything. On the screen is some kind of page, Kindle page, and it's really annoying. But one thing on there that was interesting, it said, Sussex University in England has um, um, concluded by their research that five minutes of reading a book reduces your stress 50%. It didn't say anything about remembering Krishna. But if you're too stressed out, it's pretty difficult to remember Krishna. Oh, it can be, sometimes it's a good thing. You can, get so stressed you just surrender. But sometimes we're so absorbed in our stress, you know, we want to think about it, getting rid of my stress. The stress is there, whatever anxiety. It was meant to be an incentive for us to remember Krishna. So we hear from Bhagavatam as regularly as we can, other scriptures and associate with devotees and chant Hare Krishna and pray pray and endeavor. And we, even Prabhupada said, as I mentioned earlier with the devotee who was photographing, that if you're focused on your service, for the, and if the service is actually for the service of Krishna, but also in Krishna consciousness, one's thinking how to improve my service for Krishna, how to distribute more books for Krishna, how to dress the daily nicer for Krishna, how to cook nicer for Krishna, how to manage nicely to please Krishna, and so on. How to speak nicely for Krishna. The emotive should be there. It's for Krishna. Even if we don't literally remember him, we're focused on the service which is for his pleasure. There's also a station of security, a station of being in a liberated platform, basically and the position which will evoke Krishna's mercy. Um, that he will remind us at the crucial time, moment of death particularly. If we're sincere, we have to be sincere, not duplicitous. Doing one thing, saying one thing, doing another, or thinking another, or whatever it is.